Hi, I'm Cheryl with Cheryl.wtf, and today I'm telling you a real story. It's called A Billion Gazillion Trillion Painfully Polite Years. He patted my butt when he hugged me. It made me uncomfortable, but what was I going to do? Make a big deal out of nothing? I brushed it off and retreated to the bathroom to freshen up and regroup. I was excited to be there, 2,694 miles from home, visiting a man I loved and hadn't seen since sometime before the pandemic brought the world to its knees over two years ago. Pandemic didn't bring me to my knees. No, life had already turned me into pulp and deconstructed everything I held dear. I'd already been brought to my knees and ground under its heel. I entered the pandemic, headed out of a divorce, and the inevitable betrayal and abandonment of friends I thought would be by my side forever. The pandemic was a respite, a time to close myself off from the world. It was a time to heal, to rebuild, to transform like a caterpillar in its chrysalis from mushy pulp to regal beauty, or at least something better than mushy pulp. I was ready for something new. I was just days away from publicly reinventing my business and redefining my place within the industry that I'd known since I was 18 years old. I was a monarch, ready to fly. In the weeks leading up to this trip, I had worked so hard, I was sporting a wrist brace from repetitive stress injury. I pushed myself to my limits and beyond. I was ready for a much needed three-day break before the big conference. I was ready to step away from the computer and enjoy some good company, sunny skies, and beautiful beaches. It was late, and we'd both spent the day traveling, so we didn't tarry at the hotel. A quick freshening up in the bathroom, and we were off in search of dinner and a drink. We found a cute little pub with rich, dark woods and crowded tables too close together. There were two open seats at the bar, and the band was warming up in the corner. We spent a couple hours catching up reminiscing, eating decent food, and sampling a couple drinks. It was warm and relaxed, and the live music floated around us just loud enough to make the bar feel a little less crowded. When we got back to the hotel, he cuddled up with me on the king-size bed and turned on the TV. I had requested two queen-size, but he said he couldn't find any rooms with two queen-size. When I booked my room for the conference in the next town over, I also couldn't find any so he was probably telling the truth. A few minutes into the show, he lightly started running his fingers up and down my arm and shoulder. Then he was moving across my chest, just above the neckline of my shirt. It made me uncomfortable. But what was I going to do? Make a big deal out of nothing? My whole life, he had been just a little bit more affectionate than I was comfortable with. I always figured it was me. I'm weird. I'm uncomfortable in normal social situations all the time. This was probably the same thing. He just had his arm around me. It was just my chest that he touched. I said I was tired and closed myself into the bathroom to change into pajamas and wash my face. Did your parents have a catchphrase when you were growing up? I do with my kids. Well, actually, I think I have several. But one of my favorite is you live here, you work here. Everyone contributes. My parents' catchphrase was, be a good girl. Every single time they left me at my grandparents or at a friend's house or dropped me off to work, they gave me a hug, told me to be a good girl, and waved goodbye. It was never, you're such a good girl, or thank you for being so good. No, it was only and always, be a good girl. As if, at any moment, my perfected facade would crack and shatter into a million pieces, leaving a raging demon child to rampage the countryside, terrorizing the villagers and destroying their good image as good parents. I retrieved a blanket that I'd packed, soft and warm and comfort from home. I was grateful I squeezed it into my suitcase. On one side, it was patchwork with some of my favorite fabrics. I love sewing patchwork because it means I don't have to choose just one. I can have all the different colors and patterns and textures I want. On the other side, it was a deep azure blue of jewels. The kind of color you could just fall into forever, like the deep blue of Crater Lake in Oregon. Have you ever been? The pictures don't do it justice. 
you can't capture that depth with a camera. You can only comprehend that depth after a long hike up soft volcanic ash trails, hopscotching over tree roots until your calves ache. You can only comprehend that depth on a bright, sunny day when you stepped outside your daily life, stepped outside your own head, and time freezes for just a moment. A lifetime ago, he and I made that hike on a warm August day without a cloud in the sky. We were both much younger, and I still believed it was possible to leave your problems behind by changing location. Cocooned in my blanket that night on the far edge of a huge and unfamiliar bed, 2,694 miles from home, I fell asleep thinking about adventures I'd had in previous lives and hopeful for the new ones yet to come. Jet lag is a bitch. I woke up the next morning disoriented and drowsy. Always an early riser, he was already awake. I have ADHD. This means I mostly have two modes, awake, running full speed ahead, and asleep, my mind racing while my body rests. First thing in the morning is the hardest time for me to sit still, so I don't tend to lounge in bed. Waking up with jet lag was unfamiliar and unpleasant. When he heard me stir, he rolled over and spooned me. I was still cocooned in my beautiful blue blanket, but he managed to slip an arm inside. Is this okay, he asked. No, no, it wasn't. This was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. What was I going to do? Make a big deal out of nothing? I was taught to be a good girl. I'm not supposed to make people feel uncomfortable or hurt their feelings. My comfort comes last. I am to follow the rules and do as I'm told and do whatever it takes to fit in and not make waves. I'd been taught that my entire life, by my parents first, by the kids at school who called me weird and made fun of me, by all of society, then by my abusive ex-husband. Is this okay? No, no, it, it's not okay. But when has that ever mattered to anyone? I nodded or made a noise. I'm not really sure, it's still hazy. I was starting to panic at that point. I felt like a rat trapped in a cage. I'm supposed to be a good girl. I shouldn't make anyone else uncomfortable. Besides, what was I gonna do? Make a big deal out of nothing? I laid there stone still, trying not to forget how to breathe. My mind was racing a million miles an hour and I needed to pee, but my comfort isn't important. I need to move to fidget, not only is it morning, but now I'm uncomfortable and anxious and trapped. I needed to move. Don't move. Be a good girl. Then he moved. His hand, under my blanket, where it didn't belong, shut up fast as a striking snake and closed around my right breast. Before I could even think, I shoved it away. Then my body froze while my brain went berserk. Oh my God, what just happened? What do I do? This is not okay. I'm not okay with this. Why would he do that? What crazy, demented twist of logic would make him think that this was remotely okay to do? What do I do? I'm not supposed to make other people feel bad or uncomfortable. How do I handle this? Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I don't feel safe. 2,694 miles from home by myself. What do I do? What comes next? If this man who I thought I knew so well would do something like this, what else might I miscalculate? How much danger am I in? After what felt like a billion, gazillion, trillion, painfully polite years, I got up, murmured something about needing to pee, grabbed fresh clothing out of my suitcase and locked myself in the bathroom. I took a shower. Because are you really crying if you can't feel the hot tears running down your face? Are you really crying if no one can see the tears through all the water? Eventually, I ran out of things to do in the bathroom. I had to leave. I walked out and he said, did I make you uncomfortable? Is that why you went in the bathroom? I took a deep breath and I told him it wasn't okay and he should never do it again. He apologized. We said nothing more about it and I told him I was going to take a walk and call my fiance and my kids to check in on them. 
My teenagers, who would rather just disappear on any average day, were especially chatty now that I was away from home. They told me all about every detail of their lives that happened in the last 24 hours since I'd left the house, as if somehow they knew how much I needed to hear their chatter in that moment. Last night, there was a wedding happening on the rooftop bar I shared with them. When we were heading back to our room after dinner, we passed some people from the wedding heading into the elevator. They had plates of delicious cookies, so I crashed the wedding and I stole some cookies, I told them. The 15-year-old laughed. 13-year-old got mad. Are you kidding me? What? It was funny. They were just winding down. Those cookies were going in the trash anyway. Well, the 13-year-old informed me that they were at the park yesterday and they had to leave because there was a wedding setting up. And a little while later, their friend suggested they go back and crash the wedding, but I told them that would be wrong. You're a good kid. I'm proud of you, I replied, and I meant it. I just sent you a video. Check your phone. Oh, can I bring one home for a pet? They cooed about the sea lions on the rocks below. I'm pretty sure Frank would object. Speaking of Frank, is he home? I should catch up with him too. I didn't say anything about what had happened earlier when I was on the phone with Frank. I didn't know what to say or how to say it. I wanted to forget it had ever happened. As I walked back to the hotel, he met me at the coffee shop. We got something to drink and headed into town on foot to check out a street fair. When we exhausted ourselves, we returned to the hotel room for a break. He fell asleep. In the stillness and quiet, reality started to sink in. I was not okay. I was not okay with what had happened. He had betrayed my trust, my space, my body. He was supposed to be the one person in a world that had been largely hostile, who I could trust, who would protect me. How could he do this? Then the mockingbird of voices passed with squawk inside my brain. You're making a big deal out of nothing. You're too emotional. You overreact to everything. Be a good girl, squawk. Don't upset people, squawk. Don't make any waves, squawk. This is your fault. You should have spoken up sooner, squawk. But I'm not okay with this, I cried to the mockingbird. How was I supposed to speak up sooner if that's making a big deal out of nothing? What was I supposed to do? Why did he put me in this position to have to question what's the right way to handle this? I'm not okay. What do I do? I have no car. I have nowhere to sleep for two more nights, no friends, no family. I have nothing. If I never thought he'd do this, what else will he do? I don't feel safe. What should I do? Isn't there anyone? Who can save me? When I was a kid, I thought the world was a dangerous place for kids. It was the job of adults to protect us, specifically parents. I never stopped to ask who's protecting the adults. I think I just assumed that once you were an adult, danger somehow disappeared. I blame Disney. I was so very wrong. There's no such thing as a happily ever after. Who is protecting the adults? Sitting there in that hotel room, on the far edge of a huge and unfamiliar bed, next to the sleeping form of a huge and familiar man, 2,694 miles from home, the mockingbird in my head continued to squawk. Same old lines I'd heard over and over again my whole life. You're making a big deal out of nothing. You're too emotional. You overreact to everything. Be a good girl, squaw. Be a good girl, squaw. Don't upset people. Don't make any waves, squawk. Be a good girl, squawk. I could feel the panic rising from the pit of my stomach as my brain spiraled out of control in its argument over how to deal with a situation that no one is ever prepared to deal with, can never be prepared to deal with. Have faith, people say, when they don't know what else to say, what else to do. Have faith, people say, when they realize no one's protecting the adults.
Out of nowhere, I remembered a time when my son was little. He was running around the house with a foam sword in his hand, and he cried out, Oh, God, I challenge you to a duel, you puny human. I giggled. Do you mean on guard? On guard, he said. Why would I say that? I'm trying to frighten you. Huh, on guard. Have faith. Most people equate the meaning of the word faith with belief, often belief in something without evidence or knowledge to support said belief. However, I equate faith with trust. Trust goes hand in hand with logic, reason, knowledge. And on that day, the faith I needed was faith in myself, not the divine, not in some Disney knight in shining armor. In the end, when it all fell apart, when I put my trust in the wrong people, the only one I could count on to save me was me. Suddenly, I remembered I'm not that person I used to be. And I'm not that small child whose prime directive in life is to be a good girl. You see, life had plans for me. Life had already turned me into pulp and deconstructed everything I held dear. It had brought me to my knees and ground me under its heel more than once. Believe it or not, this was not the worst situation I'd ever dealt with. Each time life stripped me bare, each time it pummeled me bloody, I got back up on my feet, forged like steel, melted and folded over and into itself, stronger, more resilient. I got on my feet, stronger, more resilient than I felt earlier. I allowed my perfected childhood facade to crack and shatter into a million pieces. Humanity are masters of deception, and there's no one you deceive more than yourself. The biggest lie you'll ever tell yourself is that you're a victim. The second you place blame for any situation outside yourself, you give away your power, all of your power, and you are immensely powerful. You have the power to create your own reality, but only if you own your reality. I am my own knight in shining armor because the night is cold and lonely and dark. I am the only heroine I need because false idols can only let you down. The world is full of terrible, awful, no good, very bad people. And safety is an illusion. We come into this world alone. We leave it alone. And ultimately, I am the only one who can protect me. I didn't rise from the ashes. I made them. I am the whole fucking fire. In that hotel room, 2,694 miles from home, I'd like to say I became a raging demon child who terrorized my father and pummeled him into a bloody pulp on the far edge of a huge and unfamiliar bed. But I did stand up, walk out of that room, and never speak to him again. It may not sound like much, just a whisper instead of a bang. Sometimes the most powerful things in life are the most unassuming. To those who may find themselves in an uncomfortable situation, to hell with being good. Be brave, be strong, be smart, be the whole fucking fire. <laughs>